We're just gonna give it one more minute and then go ahead and get started. Hey, April, great to see you again. All right. You too, Samia. Awesome. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome to UX design and UX research career paths. What we're going to do is do some introductions. Please feel free to keep introducing yourself in the chat. And then what we're going to go ahead and do is talk about design thinking, the a certain laws of UX. We're going to go through a 10 minute MBA. And then we're going to, of course, talk about kind of the meat of this presentation, which is the UX design and UX research career paths that you could be considering. Uh, and it's really great to like read the chat as I go, because then I can kind of tailor it to what types of uh, roles that you guys are in currently. So it's great to hear that there's folks who are radio presenters, uh, working in fashion in Milan. Uh, and these are all, you know, great context for me to, to hear. A little bit of background on me. Uh, my name is Samea, and I'm going to be the workshop, workshop facilitator for today. I actually ended up studying mechanical engineering in college, and then I pivoted into product design. And so I have over, I think, seven or eight years of experience now uh, in startups, agencies, corporate, you name it. I'm currently the co-founder of ID8 Labs, which provides UX courses for women. And I also mentor startups at Wharton's Venture Labs. And I'm currently working at Disney as a UX researcher. And so one of the, the biggest things I'd like to, you know, make sure we all follow is that we should all be kind to each other, whether it's in the chat or whether talking out loud and always build on each other's ideas. We're really trying to create a psychologically safe environment where both good and bad ideas can be shared openly and freely. Really, you know, try to make sure that this is a no judgment zone. So again, welcome to the nerd zone. I just want you to let you know that all questions are welcome. So feel free to type in your questions into the chat as we go through the presentation. I'll also take moments to pause after each section to make sure that any questions are addressed. And yes, I'll talk about our courses a little bit as well. So ID8 Labs uh, provides a 16 week cohort focused on introducing women, minorities and people of color into UX design. And actually our next four month course is starting in February. So definitely check out www.id8labs.co and check out our four month design MBA because that's what uh, the course would be. And you can take a look at the curriculum there as well, as well as some student testimonials. But I don't want to go into that just yet. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the course uh, after at the end. Uh, what I'd like to get started with is what is design thinking and why is it so important? So design thinking, according to the Interaction Design Foundation, is a nonlinear iterative process that teams use to understand users, challenge assumptions, redefine problems, and create innovative solutions to prototype and test. So that is definitely a mouthful of uh, what the design process is and what design thinking is. But if we want to simplify it, it's really just the process of collaborating to define problems and then find innovative solutions. And actually, it turns out that you've probably used design thinking or something like it in your current roles, or you're familiar with this process, but you didn't formally know that this was design thinking. Uh, so, you know, just kind of going back to all the descriptions that I'm seeing here, I see that folks are working in fashion, radio presenting, uh, you know, educator turned software developer turned UX. That's really amazing. Um, I'm seeing, you know, product managers, I'm seeing, uh, what else, business analysts. So yeah, folks who, you know, studied sociology, all of this really has elements of design thinking to it. So whether you're working in the film industry, like April, uh, 
that's a place where the design process is used or design thinking is used. It could be applied to furniture design. When I was in grad school, I took a furniture design course uh, and we used an applied design thinking. It can be applied to architecture, interior design, even cooking and the process of running a restaurant. Uh, a tattoo artist. We actually had a really successful student who was a tattoo artist turned UX designer, and she's now currently leading a team at a startup in both UX research and design. And it's all thanks to that the, her creative skills that she has as well. And then we've also had folks pivot from print design and and you know turn it into digital assets as well. And so I just want to let you know that design thinking applies to all forms of creative thought. But it takes one step further to be able to monetize those creative outputs and transform them into viable business solutions, which is why design thinking is so important and why it's so used in uh, the corporate world and the business world as well. In fact, corporate teams that have, you know, applied design thinking and have really active and creative design teams actually end up outperforming companies that don't have this in the S&P 500. So design and design thinking actually leads to more creative outputs, but also viable business solutions, solutions and ideas that you can actually monetize. So if you're in a creative field right now and you've sort of been struggling with the monetization aspect of it, this is the talk for you uh, to really dig a little bit more into that. And so I definitely will never advocate for being a starving artist or a creative. In fact, a lot of the creative professionals I have met who are super successful have used some type of design thinking in their daily lives to really make sure that their career blossoms into something that they're proud of and that they can feel stable in. And I think stability, financial stability in particular, especially for women, is very important. So one example of this is a really good friend of mine is an opera singer. And opera can be really competitive because, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, education that you need to get into the field, but you also need to know a lot of people in the industry to be able to get roles. And so this friend of mine actually has performed at the Met. She has performed across a variety of different theaters in Europe, and she's really good at what she does, which is opera, but she's also very good at the business and marketing and networking aspects of opera. And so she actually splits her time 50-50. She's not just focusing on her creative pursuits. She's also focusing on opera as a business and a band, a brand, her brand in particular. And so if you see her on TikTok, she has a following of like 20,000 people. And she talks about what it's like to get into opera and a, be, be a part of the opera industry. And that's what I mean by applying design thinking for um, monetizing your ideas or your creative outputs and coming up with viable business solutions. So she actively freelances and she has a lot of gigs going on at all times of the year because she treats her profession, her creativity like a business. And so at a personal level, I really hope that this talk, this whole talk helps you kind of balance the creativity that you bring to the table, as well as, you know, the work-life balance side of it and the financial security side of it. So UX design is a very financially stable uh, career path, and it also provides a lot of work-life balance. So if you've been a creative who's been struggling with these aspects of your life, this is definitely a, a really great career path to be in. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the design thinking process is. So according to Nielsen Norman Group, uh, it can be visualized as the six step process. It's the process of first empathizing with users and stakeholders, interviewing them, conducting research to understand what are the problems our users have? What are problems business stake stakeholders have in the company? And then to start to define a scope of work. What problems should you prioritize to solve for your users? What ways, what, you know, priorities should you set for the stakeholders based on the needs that they described and articulated to you? And how do you uh, define the scope of work for a project or project topic or product that you're building that considers the, the top priorities of both the users and key stakeholders involved in the project? So that's the definition part. Then it's about ideating to come up with a viable solution 
that is the answer to this problem. And as we ideate, we can, you know, go blue sky and think of the most creative ideas in the world. But then we also have to get down to what's tactical. When we start to prototype things, which is the fourth step, we have to make sure that we're able to build it in a short amount of time so that user behaviors don't change. If it takes us two years to build or three years to build, chances are people might, might not want this product anymore. We also want to make sure that, you know, it's easy for the company to start making money off of this product right away in the, within the next couple of months that it is launched. If it takes a lot of time to make money, then um, there's going to be more challenges that come up along the way. So that's the prototyping aspect. Testing it with users actually makes sure that, you know, we're getting actions to the product that we've built or uh, an idea of a product that we have. And we're making sure that users and stakeholders are both taking action when it comes to this product. And they're not just saying that they need this product or want this product like they did in the interview section. So again, putting thoughts to action. We're really making sure at this stage that users will act on wanting and needing this product and to the point of even purchasing it. And that's where we get to implementation, where we've set up a system where users have demonstrated to us that they want and need this product, that they're willing to put certain actions behind wanting and needing this product. And finally, that they're willing to purchase the product and invest money and time and effort into this product, no matter how much that might be. And so the design process could be as short as two weeks or two week sprints. It could be a two month project. It could be a two year project. At ID8 Labs, it's gonna be about a three and a half month project But as you walk through this end to end design process. Another way to visualize it is a double diamond. And so what we do at ID8 Labs is if you were to join our four month program, you would spend the first seven weeks trying to design the right thing. And what I mean by that is you would start in week one by choosing a project topic, something that you're passionate about. Uh, we've had women choose the kink and BDSM community. We've had women choose food insecurity in rural America. We've had women choose topics around healthcare and personal finances. It could be anything. And what you would do in the first two to three weeks is interview eight to 16 users in your space or topic. And you're doing a lot of primary research to really get to the heart of what users want and what key problems and themes come up during those interviews. But you're also doing a little bit of secondary research. Ideally, there should be very little or no competition in the topic or market that you choose. We don't want to choose a saturated market from a business perspective. For example, makeup is a super saturated market. It just has too many competitors. So if you were a startup, you're more likely to fail in a market like this. However, if you chose a community that was underserved, for example, women with really light skin tones or really dark skin tones, where mainstream uh, you know, makeup uh, brands are not really catering to those women, then you're more likely to succeed. And actually that's what Rihanna did with Fenty Beauty. That's a really great example of inclusive design and uh, being able to design for really marginalized communities or communities that have been un underserved by mainstream brands. And that actually led her to be a billionaire. She has a billion dollar business. So as you, you know, start to understand what the key problems and themes that are coming up from this these interviews, you're going to boil them down into themes and opportunity areas based on business strategy again. So what we're trying to do at this stage is uh, really make sure that whichever ideas we choose, we might be going pie in the sky as we start to scope them down. We're trying to get to MVP or minimum viable product by the midterms. So can we build this product idea in two to three months? Because if it takes longer, user behaviors change. So think of the pandemic, right? Um, within you know four months, a lot of restaurants went out of business because they couldn't adapt to changing user behaviors. And a lot of different businesses went out of business too, while certain businesses started to do really well because they were able to adapt. So again, building in a short amount of time is crucial, but also monetizing in a short amount of time is crucial. So are users willing to put in time, effort, and money into the solution? Are they willing to invest their own money into buying the solution? If the problem is not urgent enough and people are not willing to put money down, then, then you don't have a business. You have a community or you have a nonprofit, 
but you don't have a business. You even have a startup, but you don't have a business. So we're really trying to make sure that whatever idea you scope and focus on ends up being something that could be a viable business. And that's when we actually start to design things. So it takes seven weeks to do that sort of in-depth, rigorous business strategy and design thinking and research um, before we can actually build the product. And we have to invest that time into the research and business strategy because we don't want to end up building something that nobody needs. There are lots of startups, about 80, 90% of startups will fail because they don't build something that anyone actually wants. And they usually go off of the founder's ego and they build something that's not really required and nobody's willing to buy it. And so we really want to make sure that we build the right thing before we start designing it right in the right way. So now that we've honed in on what our MVP or minimum viable product idea is, we start to come up with different visualizations of what that idea could look like and what it could feel like. So we start to ideate again, we generate a lot of different visualizations for what this idea could look like. And then we test it, we iterate on it, we get feedback and we scope it down again. And we finally come up with one visualization or one uh, prototype of what this product could look like. And so that takes about 14 weeks to go through the end-to-end -end design process. And these are just different visualizations of what design thinking looks like. But the truth is, it really looks like this to me. It looks like in the first seven weeks, you're going to have a hazy topic in your mind that you're passionate about, but don't know much about. And then as you do your interviews, you're going to have a lot of questions. There's a lot of uncertainty to unpack. But then as you keep going through the interviews, things get clearer. You start to distill down insights and um, themes from those interviews. And then you start to layer in business strategy, technical and operations constraints as you start to come up with a, a very viable solution. And so finally you get to your concept idea and that's when you're starting to get more clarity and focus. And now you have both qualitative and quantitative data to back up that this MVP idea that you created actually has legs, is actually going to be maybe 70 or 80% confident in the market that yes, you're confident this is going to succeed. If you had to pitch it to investors or business stakeholders, you'd be you know, at least 70 to 80% confident because design is still pretty subjective. We can't say we're 100% confident this will succeed in the market, but we have to show with qualitative and quantitative data that we are pretty confident that this is going to succeed in the market. And so again, we need to start to reframe traditional perspectives as we move from problem to solution. And we need to be able to communicate our insights in a way that reframes the problem and the solution. So it's simply a new way to look at the world and then talk about it. That's where innovative solutions come from. And it's also a very interdisciplinary way to approach problems and solutions. So some of the best ideas are formulated at the intersection of desirability, which is what, is, what do users want and need? Viability, how do we do this? Uh, or who will pay for this? And what's the return on investment? As well as feasibility, how long does it take to build? What's the effort that it would take to build this? How much um, operations, activities do we need to do to build this? So when we think of desirability, we're thinking of user needs. Does it fill a user need? Will it fit into people's lives? Can we make them want it? When we think about viability, we're thinking about, does it align with business and stakeholder goals? What's the return on investment? Can this be done within a budget? And will people actually purchase it or buy it? So that's the monetization angle. And then when we're thinking about feasibility, we're thinking about what are the tech, con tech, tech constraints and how long will it take to build? So you might be wondering, this is a really long process. Why do we talk to users? You know, Is it really needed? Can't I just go look at a competitor and copy what that competitor does and then build my product that way? The answer is yes, you could. And a lot of companies do do that, but they're not very innovative com companies. They are companies that are always going to be one step, two step, 10 steps, 100 steps behind their competitors, and they're never going to surpass their competitors. And if there are tough times, tough economic times, they're probably the first ones who are going to go out of business. 
So if you really want to get to the heart of innovation, you really have to do that primary research yourself. You really have to go out there and talk to users yourself. It is not enough to talk to just three to five users like most other UX boot camps do. You have to talk to a larger number of users. Eight to 16 users is what we recommend. Sometimes even 20, 30, if you're really serious about building a business. And the reason is when we start talking to people, we get beyond their conscious mind. So we're not really getting to surface level things, we're getting beyond surface level. Uh, we are going on a one hour in-depth interview with them, we're reading their body language, we're taking note of their emotions as they're talking through different topics um, and different scenarios, and we're really trying to un uncover what their subconscious is telling us. What are their attitudes? What are their beliefs? What are their values? What are their instincts? It's really important to uncover these emotions because emotional emotional design is really crucial. If we design something based on user emotion, it's more likely to connect with that user and it's more likely uh, to be used and purchased by that user. So I really advocate for digital and UX design above everything else because it's a career path that's easy to pivot into and it offers a lot of financial stability. And like someone mentioned at the beginning of this call, there's just so much demand for it right now. Uh, so now you have kind of an overview of the design thinking process and the design process, what it's like to go through the full process, at least in theory, but the only way you can learn this is by putting it into action. Design is a very action-based career path, and it's not enough to just know theory or take the Google Coursera course. That's great for theory and understanding definitions, but you actually have to act through the whole design process. Uh, again, there's so much demand right now for UX designers and researchers, and more apps are being built and developed every day. So this is a great time to join the digital UX design world. So what I just talked about was the overall design thinking process that can be applied to furniture design, product design, engineering, uh, architecture, you name it. But now let's kind of focus things in on digital design specifically. So there are a couple of cognitive laws that are in place to help us designers think through how to visualize our ideas. One of them is Jacob's Law. And Jacob's Law states that users spend most of their time on other websites and applications rather than the website or startup or application that you are trying to create. So their mental models are already formulated around existing digital design patterns. A great example of this is Netflix. So Netflix was the first, one of the first streamers to start, right? They started by, you know, mailing us DVDs and then they became more sophisticated and they were able to put a repository of movies and shows online that we could watch. And so we sort of got used to the, the look and feel of what Netflix felt like. And so you'll notice that when you go into Roku TV or when you go into other streaming apps, a lot of them copy kind of the layout of Netflix because Netflix was the first one. And I actually happened to work for a smart TV uh, company. And we also had certain patterns that were very similar to Netflix because people were already familiar with Netflix. So there was no need to reinvent the wheel, no need to create really different visual design patterns. We just had to do what worked best, what was most efficient for users to already understand and follow, what would give users the least amount of cognitive load. But at the same time, we have to think about new product development at established companies. So while Netflix is, you know, probably one of the leading streamers in the business, they are also indirectly competing with other entertainment platforms like Spotify and TikTok for user attention. And so actually during the pandemic, Netflix was kind of competing with TikTok a lot because people would scroll on TikTok during the pandemic, especially, and they would not watch Netflix, right? They would be spending two hours before bed scrolling on TikTok rather than watching a TV show or a movie. And so Netflix started to study how these different media companies would place media in front of users. And the, tick, the reason TikTok was so popular was because one piece of content was placed in front of a user at a time. Uh, and it was easy to, you know, just look at one piece of content and then keep going. And so Netflix studied these behaviors. They also studied channel surfing on TV 
And they came up with a feature called Play Something, which was around 2021. I'm not sure if Play Something exists still, but it, it used to be a feature. Play Something is very similar to TikTok, where when you click Play Something, Netflix will pull up what they believe will be the best thing for you to watch. And then you can kind of channel surf and click next if you're not really into the show within the next 10 to 15 seconds of the show starting or the film starting. So that's play something. And so Netflix is learning from these other user patterns all the time as well, and really incorporating other patterns from indirect competitors into their uh, UI. So again, remember the whole point of Jacob's Law is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Can your design be so good that it's almost invisible? If I use Netflix, I don't think about where I have to click next or what I have to do. Things kind of automatically happen. And that's great. I don't have to think about the navigation. I don't have to think too hard about finding content. I'm Usually, it's very easy for me to find something. However, when I go on HBO Max, uh, which is now just Max, I believe, uh, I have a really hard time finding content and playing content and like picking up where I left off with TV shows. And so the design is not invisible. I have to think a lot and I have to use a lot of cognitive load to get to what I want to do. We're trying to eliminate as much cognitive load as we can. Another law is Hicks law. So the time to make a decision increases with the amount of complexity and the number of choices. Uh, so again, Netflix realized that they had to create something like play something because they were competing with TikTok, which just puts one piece of content in front of you and you can watch that content or say no. So it's like a swipe right, swipe left, yes or no to one piece of content. However, with Netflix, there's just so many options, right? Maybe when they were first starting out, all those options were really exciting because they were the first to do it. They were the first streamer, but then it just became too much. As their content repository grew, they needed a way to sift through content, to organize content, categorize it, filter it, and make sure that they were pulling up the most relevant piece of content to their users. And so when they saw patterns of how TikTok does it, they started to copy and do something similar. So Hicks Law kind of talks about that paradox of choice. The more choices there are, the more decisions there are to make, and the more time it takes or, or the more complexity it takes to finally make that decision. And that's the reason why Amazon came up with the one-click buy. And that actually has a very technical, complex process behind it. So Amazon has actually patented the one-click buy. So the only other place you will see the one-click buy is with one other brand. Do you know what brand that is? Does anyone know where else they've seen the one click buy? You can type it into the chat. Not eBay, or maybe they do. I actually haven't seen eBay for a while. So maybe you're right. I was thinking of uh, Apple, Apple Music. When you click the one click you know, buy, they have your information on file. And the moment you click buy, the music piece is added into your repository. That actually Apple has to license that one click buy option from Amazon every time they use it. Um, so it, it's really interesting. Not many companies have the money to license the one click buy from Amazon. Um, so that's why not many companies do it. But again, remember the time is money, right? So Amazon really simplified their checkout process with just a one-click buy or even with Alexa, right? You can just say, hey, Alexa, I want to buy this and then it's bought. And little five-year-olds are buying $500 products <laughs> just randomly by, by talking to Alexa. So the less time it takes to buy something, the more chances of success you have, the more chances are that your user is going to check out with that product. Uh, again, the more complex your checkout process is, the more steps it has, fewer users are going to complete the checkout process. So Amazon has really mastered the art of purchasing. But at the same time, even though they're making their UI very efficient, we have these questions posed by different you know, news outlets. In Amazon, we trust, but why? So it seemed that you know, during the pandemic, we really trusted Pam Amazon to deliver what we needed when things were shut down, when there were slower supply chains or broken supply chains. 
But at the same time, we don't trust Amazon and we don't trust what Amazon does to our data or our privacy. Same thing with Facebook. We use it to stay connected to our network, to our friends, but we don't like what they're doing with ads and their ads targeting and how they know too much about us. Um, and you see, you know, uh, headlines like this start to pop up. So with that, I just want you to think about um, a little bit about ethical design as well. So that's where, you know, going back to design thinking, we really have to balance the user perspective and user needs with business needs and stakeholder needs. And so clearly in Facebook, right, when I scroll through in Instagram now, one in three or two posts is an ad. And so they're making money off of one or two posts. Before it used to be one in 10 posts used to be an ad or one in five. And that was more palatable to the user needs. Now the business needs are prioritized even more and making money is prioritized even more. And that leads to a sort of imbalance. People are not happy with Instagram as much. People are looking for new social media outlets all the time. So it all comes down to balancing the user perspective with the business needs and also really understanding the emotions behind each of these things and the ethics behind each of this. So I hope that those news uh, headlines help you think through the ethics behind what's good to do or a bad decision to make as a designer or a researcher. And with that, we're going to start to wrap up with our 10 minute MBA and the career paths. Before I move on, does anyone have any questions? All right. Uh, so the reason I'm putting in this 10 minute MBA in here is because throughout our four month program, we ask you to think like a startup or a small business, but we also want you to start to think about how things scale as the business matures and becomes a multi-million dollar corporation or a global company. Um, and there's different UX activities we do depending on whether we're working at a startup, an agency, or a large corporation. So UX as a career path sort of changes depending on what type of company you're in or what industry you're in, whether that's healthcare or finance or things like that. So to give you kind of an overview of how a company scales, it all starts with the creation of the MVP or minimum viable product, which is what you will be building in the four month design MBA program with us. And then it also leads into more experimentation or something that we call pre-totyping that leads to product market fit. And product market fit happens when there's so much demand for your product or your MVP that you don't have the time to change the product or tweak your MVP solution anymore. So as a startup, before you reach product market fit, you're constantly tinkering with your product and improving it. But until you get to that point where there's so much demand, where all your operations and, and thought and activity needs to be focused on sales and, and, and you know just selling the product, um, until then, you're really still focused on improving the product and really incrementally, you know, making sure that this product is getting better every every time. Once you get to product market fit, you're selling it so much that you don't have as much time to put into improving the product. And so you now have to balance more sales activities, maybe 70 to 80% of your time on sales activities and only 10 to 20% of your time as a business in product development. So that's, you know, more small businesses are kind of in that stage. And then at some point you start to scale where you're now targeting different types of audiences or users. And these users are approaching you from different channels. So you might be targeting 20% of your users coming from social media marketing. Another 20% comes from Google ads. Another 20% comes from uh, you know, reading literature online or some lead generation tool on your website. Or you might have users in multiple states or multiple countries. And so those could be different channels. And at this point, you've kind of grown to a nationwide company or a global company, and you have more complex operations. And again, you're spending less and less time on product development and UI UX design. So that's why UI UX changes depending on the type of company you're in. When we're at that place where we're trying to understand the problem and trying to build our MVP, there's a lot of um, UX UI design work to complete. 
And so you'll be doing a lot of discovery interviews. It's very heavy on the UX research and business strategy side of things. You'll be doing coming up with a lot of different visualizations for what this potential solution could look like. And then yes, especially as you're starting to you know, define what the MVP is, you'll be doing a lot of beta testing to really making sure that you know whatever you design is super simple. My favorite example of an MVP product is uh, Tinder. And that's because it's so simple with its functionality. It's literally just a swipe right, swipe left, or messaging people if you match. That was the MVP Tinder started with back in 2014. It's, it's a pretty old app now. And they've added on features to it as they have grown and become a multi-billion dollar business. And then when it comes to product market fit, you're really starting to think about how can I gain more users? How can I sell more? And you might A-B test your product idea. You might A-B test landing pages or the, you know, the customer experience, which we will talk about shortly. Uh, and you're really trying to grow your reach across different types of audiences. And then finally, as you're getting to product market fit, you're starting to define different audience segments and different user types and, and attract even more user types as you go. So with that, I'm going to start to talk about some career paths you can think about in UX. Uh, there's different terminologies for how design is practiced, though there are similarities and commonalities across all these modes of design. And we'll start with design thinking, which is what we first talked about. Design thinking is this iterative process of reframing and re-understanding user problems at a deeper level uh, to really build an innovative solution. And it is interdisciplinary. So if you're really being innovative, you should be considering business, tech, and the user perspective. And an example of design thinking at play is building innovative products like Airbnb, which was a new take on how you know, it completely disrupted the way we decide to go to hotels or not. Service design is the practice of improving an organization's internal practices, processes, and pooling together company resources to positively affect the employees and indirectly their customers. So if you work in UX, this is the type of work that you're going to be doing if you work for an agency or consulting firm. I worked for a couple of years in the consulting world, and I would work for larger companies, Fortune 500 companies like Johnson & Johnson, Facebook, or Meta, Ford, to really help them in, you know, manage their internal processes and come up with internal tools to help them with their day-to-day -day operations. And so that was the design work that I primarily did. Again, an example of service design work is what I just said. It's optimizing processes across teams with software that you could design. And then customer experience design considers the end-to-end -end experience of the customer, both before and after conversion. So when you go online and you search UX designer or UI designer or UX researcher, they're all really just focused on the actual product itself. But if you want to focus on customer experience, you might be more of a brand designer, or you might be more of a visual designer or a marketing designer. Those are titles that you can look for as well. And that actually focuses on actually designing marketing materials. So a lot of graphic designers do this as well. And those marketing materials might be email images, it might be PowerPoints, it might be header images or hero images for websites, for ads on TV. Uh, it could be any type of medium uh, that you could, you know, it could involve animation creation um, and things like that as well. And then not only does it matter what kind of uh, materials you put in front of users before they purchase the product, but then after they purchase the product, there are certain experiences that, uh, you know, customer experience design would consider as well. So think about, you know, customer support materials or check-ins um, with users after they purchase, maybe three months after they purchase or six months after they purchase or a couple of weeks after they purchase. Um, and again, that constant engagement with users who've already purchased the product is customer experience, especially if you're uh, selling a subscription, you want to make sure that your users are constantly engaged. An example of customer experience design is the process of exploring all the messaging to customers, both before, during, and after they buy a product or service. 
And then UX is a piece of that. So that is considering, it's also interchangeable with the term product design, but it's considering uh, the process of creating a product that satisfies user needs. And an example of this is understanding what users want before designing an app or platform. UI is actually the process of building or creating those digital interfaces. So I know I threw, threw a lot of definitions at you. So I'm gonna show you a few visuals to kind of help you make sense of all of this. So here's one visual of customer experience versus service design versus UX. Here's another way to look at it. There's systems design, which is design thinking that we had talked about initially, where it's applicable to social innovation, architecture, cooking, products, you name it. Then service design, which is more applicable to internal processes or um, services as well. Then UX design and then UI design. Here's another way to visualize it whichever one you most resonate with. I know different people uh, gravitate to different uh, images or visualizations, but that's kind of the gist of what UX is, what the UX to career paths are. If you are interested in UX as a career path, what I would love to do is get in touch with you. So if you're interested in our four month design MBA program, um, please get in touch with me. I'm gonna share uh, a link right now to a Calendly so that you can set up a one-on-one -on -one with me if you're interested in taking our course. Uh, basically, this, this whole talk gives you an overview of the curriculum that we would cover within the course. Um, and I also wanted to leave these last you know, 15 minutes open for folks to ask questions or let me know what they're thinking. So here is the link for the one-on-one. -on -one. And if you would like to connect with me on LinkedIn as well, uh, I always share free resources in UX design. Um, so here's a link to my LinkedIn. But I hope that this session was helpful. And I hope that, you know, there's a new takeaway that you found when you're starting to consider UX design and research as a career path. So are there any questions? Yes, what we can do is we will email you a recording of this talk after um, after the, the call, but we don't make the slides available. You'll see the, the recording of the talk on YouTube. Any other questions? All right. If there's no other questions, I'll hang out here for a second, but thanks so much for, for joining. Um, and I hope this answered some of your questions on UX. Great to see you, April. Thanks so much, Esther. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel.